Well, if you've been uh, with us as we've been working our way through the book of James, you'll know that there have been a number of times when he has spoken of uh, the heart that's behind so much of the conflict uh, we see in our world. So, for example, have a look at these uh, words we were looking at a few weeks ago from the beginning of chapter 4. James writes, uh, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle, literally, that wage war within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. Isn't what James says so true? Isn't it true that so often, uh, whether they're personal or whether they're national, International conflict arises when uh, someone has something that, that we want but that we don't have. I uh, learned earlier this week that the uh, United Nations Environment Programme estimates that competing for national, uh, natural resources has been a factor in at least 40% of armed interstate conflicts in the past 60 years. And that in the past 30 years, since 1990, at least 18 violent conflicts have been fueled by uh, the exploitation of natural resources, whether that's high-value things like uh, timber and diamond and gold and minerals and oil, or scarce things like water and fertile land. As James says, you desire, but you do not have so you kill. And dare I say, a similar uh, desire is probably behind uh, some of those nations who haven't committed to as much as they have done, uh, could have done uh, at COP26 over the past few days. And as in the verses we're looking at this week, there's a particular desire that James wants to speak about. It's the desire for wealth. And wealth like Any other desire can be as destructive as all those others. Have a look at uh, the end of our reading, or towards the end, verses 5 and verse uh, 6. James, he's addressing the rich, and he says, You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourself in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. (coughs) James says to these rich people, don't you see your desire for wealth? It's destroyed others. Now, slightly confusingly, the people who James was writing to uh, were not especially rich. If you've been with us throughout our time in James, you might remember that uh, they were largely Jewish Christians who had fled from Jerusalem when the church there started to be uh, persecuted. And so they weren't rich. They were refugees scattered across the Middle East. They'd fled their homes with all the possessions they could scoop up in their arms because of the violence that would have faced them if they stayed people scattered across the Middle East, carrying their possessions, fleeing from violence. It's tragic, isn't it, that some things never change. And so these people who James was writing to, they weren't uh, rich, but they did know some rich people who were causing them trouble. And in fact, they were the people who were on the wrong end of this bad treatment. Uh, They were the people who, uh, verse 4, weren't being paid a proper wage for their work. They were the people who, verse 5, were the victims of those living these extravagant lifestyles. They were dying while others were living in luxury. And these are the people who James wants to help. He wants to help these poor refugee Christians. And so here's what he does. He speaks to these rich oppressors in the hearing of these refugees. And he speaks to these rich people because he wants to help these believers know that they shouldn't, want to, shouldn't envy 
uh, the rich. And he wants them to be encouraged that despite what it feels like, despite appearances, that the day of justice is coming. And although, by and large, we're in a very different place to James's original uh, hearers, we too need to hear uh, what he has to say this morning. Because the world we, we live in, it, it measures um, what we're worth by how much we have, doesn't it? Our culture, it's one where uh, amassing money and amassing possessions, that's unquestionably a good thing. Where we're encouraged to envy those who have uh, more than us even perhaps if they've trampled over others to get to where they are. The temptation to envy can live in any of our hearts as well. And of course, our world is full of injustice. It's full of injustice. And that injustice, it can shake anyone's uh, faith to the core. Any belief we may have in God, can be troubled by the world we live in. After all, if the God of the Bible is the God who opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble, that's who God is. Well, why is the world in the mess that it's in? Perhaps some may be wondering, God isn't as good as he he says he is, that maybe my trust in him is misplaced. And so James, he he speaks to us as much as he speaks to his original hearers. And let's, um, so therefore, see what he has to say, starting with this encouragement not to be envious. And here's the reason he gives us. Wealth won't last. You see, James, he doesn't want his uh, hearers to make the mistake that others were making of desiring things that they did not have and so lashing out violently. Let's have a look at what he says. Let me read from verse 1 again as he addresses these rich oppressors in the hearing of these oppressed Christians. Now listen, you rich people. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Don't envy the rich, James says, because their wealth, it won't last. And he gives us, to help us get our head around this, three really vivid pictures looking back from the vantage point of the last day to help us see that wealth won't last. First, he says, your wealth is rotted. Now, this um, doesn't work so well in a world of plastic banknotes, but imagine 10 years ago, you'd wrapped up all of your money and um, you'd buried it in a hole in the garden. And this afternoon was the time when you were going to go and dig it up and pull it out of that hole. And you're quite excited about this because it's a lot of money you buried in the garden. Well, if you were digging it up and you came across a sort of mushy pile of what used to be money. That would be a pretty disappointing uh, sight, wouldn't it? Or maybe you, 10 years ago, was more sensible and you'd rolled up your money and you'd stuck it in a safe. Well, while you may still have that money from uh, 10 years ago, inflation has been slowly chipping away at its value. And even over a fairly short 10-year period, your money from 10 years ago has lost 25% of its value. James, he says, what we think has value will ultimately be proved to be worthless. (laughs) Second, he says, moths have eaten your clothes don't know about you, but there are a few things more uh, frustrating than, than pulling out a favourite jumper from the wardrobe at the start of autumn to discover the, uh, the moths have beaten you to it. Full of holes, it's no use to you. thought I'd go and find a picture so you knew what it looked like. 
And then I went to pull out my jumper for church this morning. <laughs> Dear me. Time, it takes its toll on the things that we value. So much so. So much so that James says at the beginning of verse 3, your silver and your gold are corroded. Now, I don't know if there are any chemists among us uh, this morning, but if they are, they might want to stick their hand in the air and say, James, you don't understand. Silver and gold, they don't corrode. But that only serves, I think, to make James's point more strongly. Wealth, it won't last. If bullion, if gold and silver, if things that hold their value like no other ultimately come to nothing, well, then there's no hope for our material possessions. Wealth, James says, it won't last. So don't envy the rich. Don't go to extreme and violent lengths to get what they have. These guys needed to hear that, and we uh, need to hear this, because it can be so tempting, can't it, to envy those who have more than us with their, their wealth, with their fine clothes, with their gold and their silver. They look like they've got everything sorted. But James tells us that what they've built their life upon will ultimately come to nothing. Uh, these words, the, the sort of dose of reality, it should pour cold water uh, over our envy. And yet I know that this can still be a real struggle, a real battle. And so if this is a fight that you're uh, fighting, these words from Proverbs, this prayer from Proverbs might be a real blessing. If this is something you uh, struggle with, this sort of envy, why not pray this prayer? every day for a month, and see what God does with that. See how he changes uh, both your own attitude towards your own wealth and your attitude towards the wealth of others. What does Proverbs say? Uh, Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal. And so dishonor the name of my God. It's a really good thing to pray when you find envy bubbling up in your heart. And just imagine, just imagine what the world would be like if God answered that prayer, not only for us, but for millions around uh, the world there'd be much, much less conflict, wouldn't there, for us to lament. And so James says, don't be envious. Wealth, it won't last. And the rich, what should they do? Verse 1, they should weep and wail because of the misery that's coming upon them when their riches disappear. But more significantly, they should weep and wail because justice is coming. Now, of course, as we're doing uh, today, it is uh, right and proper that we take time to uh, remember those who've given their lives in conflict, to honour those who have died for our freedom that we may live. But tragically, those are not the only lives affected by uh, conflicts. Earlier this week, I I read a report about the number of uh, Afghans who are paying people smugglers to, to get them out of the country. That number has skyrocketed since the Taliban uh, seized power. And then having taken their money, what happens? Well, some of these smugglers just leave them for dead in the desert, miles from anywhere. Others, if they get to the border, are just pushed back away because they don't have enough money to bribe the border forces. (coughs) Innocent civilians exploited for financial gain. And the people who are are doing it are just getting away with it. Where's the justice in that? 
We're a million miles removed from their situation. But it still, it rightly horrifies us. And among those uh, Afghans fleeing the country, there's a disproportionate number of Christians desperate to leave because if they stay and the Taliban find them, they're dead. They'll be killed for their faith, just like that. Which is a situation, again, not a long way away from the one in which uh, James's original hearers would have found themselves. After all, what did verse 6 tell us? Their rich oppressors are getting away with murder, quite literally. They, along with the Afghan uh, Christians fleeing the ta- Taliban today, could be forgiven for thinking there's no justice, that at worst the universe was stacked against them. Oh, sorry, the best, the universe is stacked against them. That at worst, God doesn't care. And so what does James say? He says, be patient. Justice is coming. Be patient. Justice is coming. God does care. He will see that wrongs are righted. Look again with me at verse 2. James, writing to the rich, says, Your wealth has rotted, moths have eaten your clothes, your gold and silver are corroded, and their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. James, he says that one day, all the wealth that the rich oppressors have hoarded up will testify against them. All that wealth that God intended be used for the benefit of others. They've hoarded and they've kept themselves. And God says uh, the one day that rotten, hoarded wealth will take its place in the witness box and it'll testify against its owners before God sitting on the judge's bench. The warnings continue. Verse 4, look. The wages you fail to pay the workers who mowed your field are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. Now, maybe some of the rich would say that paying their laborers is something that's easily uh, to overlook in a, a world where they don't have automated payroll. After all, they had a lot going on. They had to uh, plan the crops for next season. They had to take this season's product to to, to market. They had to uh, watch what their competitors were doing to see that they weren't uh, missing a trick. I'm sorry your your wages are a bit late this month. It's just too much to do. But of course, for the labourer, no pay meant no food. No pay meant not surviving. It's not just them, it's their whole family. And so their unpaid wages, James says, will join the labourers in crying out to God for justice. And in fact, James says that those cries have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. The judge who will act has heard their testimony. And so James, he concludes his indictment of the rich. Verse 6, you have condemned and murdered the innocent one. Uh, That is the exploited worker who was not opposing you. There will be no way that the rich are able to justify their actions. And so what does James do? He tells his readers, verse 7, Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. Until the day when those misused uh, resources will testify against their (coughs) oppressors, when the cry of the unpaid wages will be heard by all, when the oppressors will be held to account for the murder of the innocent. Be patient, James says, because one day soon, all the injustice in the world will cease. And those who are responsible will be held to account. I 
And I imagine for James's original hearers, those words would have been words of real comfort. That would have enabled them to keep going. But maybe for some of us, James's words about justice are making us feel pretty uncomfortable this morning. Maybe, however subtly it happens, you do uh, measure your success by your bank balance and actually you're, you're doing all right. Maybe you'd never describe yourself in these ways, but the description of verse 5 is, is painfully close to home. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. And while you may not be a landowner who's neglected to pay his labourers' wages, if you're honest, you don't really give much thought to how the workers who make your clothes or your gadgets are treated in the far-flung places in which they do that. And maybe the idea of this future justice sounds like something to be a bit nervous about rather than something to patiently wait for. Well, if that's you, let me uh, close by saying something about uh, Jesus. Because the truth is, whether we're rich or whether we're poor, uh, on our own, actually, we all stand guilty before our God. It's not just how we use our riches that will um, that could testify against us, that could condemn us. There's all sorts of things we do. But here's the good news of the Christian uh, faith. Jesus, the only truly innocent one, left the luxury of heaven to come to earth, to live in poverty. Uh, He put himself in the firing line, uh, so to speak, to take our guilt, to take our condemnation upon himself as he was murdered on the cross. And he did that, not that we might have something of passing value like gold or silver, but that we might have something of eternal uh, significance. He, he gave his life that, that we might have peace, peace with God and peace with one another, that we can look forward to the day when we will live with him forever in a world free of injustice. That's the hope, the promise that the Christian faith holds out to us. And what's more, the Bible tells us that as we look forward to that day, as we patiently wait for it, God is at work in our hearts, changing us, transforming us, making us more just. One small way he would do that is by answering that prayer of Proverbs 30 of making us, um, yeah, just in how we use our money, wanting God the more than material possessions, wanting to honour him rather than accumulate for ourselves. And so if you find yourselves unsettled by uh, James's words, uh, James would say this to you. He'd say, come to Jesus, be saved by Jesus. He'd say, pray to Jesus, be transformed by Jesus. And if that's all uh, new for you, I'd love to chat more after uh, the service. Do come and and find me. That would be a great thing uh, to do. But for now, I'm going to close this part of our time together by leading us uh, in a prayer. Let me do that now. Heavenly Father, thank you that as we were singing earlier, Jesus has paid it all, that he has made it possible for people like us who aren't innocent to stand before you and not be condemned. Thank you for that. And Father, would you make him such a treasure in our hearts that we wouldn't envy the rich, would we see how living with him forever is so much better than the passing um, 
value of wealth. And would that free us from envy? And Father, where in the injustice in the world um, uh, shakes us, would we be patient looking forward to the day when he will come back and put everything right? And Father, as we wait for that day, would you work in our hearts that we might be people who love and do justice? And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.